Welcome to the final episode of the special edition of A Closer Look, The Opioid Crisis in Our City. I'm Karen Myers. Let's talk about solutions, support, and programs. What steps can we take to combat the opioid crisis, and what are the services and programs in place? Today, we're going to talk about the steps we can take to combat the opioid crisis and help break the stigma. Here to tell us what resources, services, and programs are available in our city from Chesapeake Integrated Behavioral Health Care is Andrea Pavlik, Petrell Lewis, Jennifer Melillo, Kim Lucas, and Jennifer Modica. Welcome, ladies. I appreciate uh, you coming in today. So I'm just going to start right in with Kim. So can you tell us what is the OBAT program? First, what does it stand for? Yes, we love our acronyms, don't yes. we? <laughs> the OBAT stands for Office-Based Addiction Treatment. So what it is is a treatment program. I imagine it as a three-legged stool. Okay. We have a prescriber who pre prescribes the medication, the medication-assisted treatment. We have behavioral health therapists who provide counseling. And we have uh, care coordination that sort of... Uh, interacts with all of the folks on the team and the individual and helps serve other needs that they might have. So how can individuals access this service? Well, the access to the services through our, our, our main access is same day access program. Okay. Uh, Andrea will speak of that later, but they do a full assessment, determine if the individual is eligible for the service, uh, where they are in their recovery, where they are in their uh, addiction approach and they get them linked up with all of the appointments that they need so it's really a one-stop shop. So what is case management and how can be, uh, that benefit someone? Case management sort of uh, fills in all the gaps with people who have other service needs. Mm -hmm. They Maybe they have co-occurring disorders, psychiatric disorders, they'll get linked with a psychiatrist, they, they might have uh, need a recovery home, a home that is more conducive to sober living. And so the case manager can help link them up with, you know, one of the recovery homes mm -hmm. in the area. They can help them with their employment by linking them up with employment services or um, other, other needs that arise right. that the individual has because addiction affects so many parts of a person's life mm -hmm. that we're actually addressing all of these areas. And it can above. be over, overwhelming, I'm sure, when you need more it than is. one resource and to have someone there to help you mm -hmm. to access those resources, I'm sure. And the is care a great coordinator mm -hmm. is that, that person who can kind of mm -hmm. be the point person that they, they mm -hmm. call or they come to right. and interact with every, every and area. That's great. So, Jennifer, what type of therapy do you offer for substance use disorder? So, we offer individual therapy, individual counseling, and we have three groups that are dedicated to substance use disorders. Our most intensive group is our intensive outpatient group, and that's a group that is designated for more moderate to severe patterned use of um, substances and it meets three times a week for three hours each meeting and it runs for about three to four months. Um, we also offer a recovery maintenance group mm -hmm. which is open to individuals who have been in recovery for at least 30 days. So they might be individuals who have graduated from our intensive outpatient group or they might be individuals who are coming out of detox um, and so that that group meets once a week for an hour and a half once yeah, did I say once a week mm -hmm. once a week for yeah. an hour and a half. And that one lasts for about two to three months. We also have a unique group called um, Motivational Enhancement Therapy, and that's a group that is designated for individuals who may be having some trouble acknowledging the harmful relationship that's developed mm -hmm. with substances. And so that seeks to provide an opportunity for exploring some of the ambivalence that comes with that um, type of thinking and create some more positive um, change towards recovery. So do they meet at CIBH? The groups meet at CIBH, yes. Okay. And we also offer individual, of course, mm -hmm. and then um, for services that we don't offer at the agency, we do offer linkage to other types of treatment, so be it residential and all of that or detox. Is on the website, I'm sure. Yes. Okay. All, that, all right. Yeah. So, Andrea, can you tell us about safe drug use and harm reduction? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, harm reduction is kind of exactly what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. um, that is all about reducing the harm that's associated with drugs. So, that brings us to safe drug use. And there's a couple of different things that I really want to highlight about mm -hmm. that. Um, one is never using alone because it's really dangerous to use substances alone, specifically opioids. Um, there is a resource for that. It's called the Never Use Alone Hotline. So, if you are alone, 
um, you can call this hotline number and somebody's going to answer. It's going to be a peer, mm -hmm. not somebody who like not someone clinical or anything like that. And they're going to keep you on the line. They're going to ask you what substance you use. They're going to ask you your exact location and they're going to ask you your name. Um, and then they're going to monitor you for about the next, well, the time that they monitor you depends on what kind of drug that you're using. And if you become unresponsive, um, they will call like 911 or EMS and they will send somebody out to your location. And so some people, I just want to note, some people may think, well, that's interesting that you're actually, you know, know that somebody's about to use. But the reality is, if they are going to do it, you want them to have a safe outcome. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that that is the harm or the heart of harm reduction is that we value somebody's life over the fact that they're using drugs. Right, right. Um, that is the most important thing. And there's a couple other things to speak on with harm reduction, too. Um, we have a couple things in front of us mm -hmm. right now. One, these are fentanyl test strips. Mm -hmm. um, so you can test your drugs to see if fentanyl is in there because fentanyl is a very potent uh, opiate that's out there. And Jennifer, I know, can speak a little bit more about that. Um, but that can cause an overdose very quickly. So if you don't Absolutely. know that you have fentanyl in the substance that you're using, that can lead to an overdose before you know it. Another thing with that, if you're not using alone, and again, it's really important not to use alone, having somebody carry what we call Narcan, mm -hmm. which can reverse an overdose. Um, so those are two things. Another couple things that are out there are syringe exchange programs. Mm -hmm. um, so making sure that you're using clean syringes. Um, anything else that I'm forgetting? So always test your drugs. Um, you can always use more. You can never use less. So you don't want to go and use a big amount. Again, fentanyl is more potent than what most people are used to using. So start small. Um, another important thing to know is that if you have stopped using for any period of time, mm -hmm. especially people that have been incarcerated or maybe they go to rehab, mm -hmm. anything like that, if you mm -hmm. stop using for any amount of time, your uh, tolerance is going to decrease. Mm -hmm. So if you try to go back to using and you try to use the same amount you were using before, you're most likely going to overdose. I have heard that before, that your body, you, you may take a break from it and you may go back to using, like you just said, something that's the same amount as before and your body is just not going to be able to handle that. No. So tell us, where can someone get some of the, the packets that you mentioned? So right now, uh, CIBH has what we call rescue bags that mm -hmm. includes both of those things. And you can come to CIBH. You do not have to be a client at CIBH. Mm -hmm. um, anybody can come there and grab rescue bags. You can grab them for loved ones. You can grab them for yourself. Mm -hmm. You can grab them for whoever needs them. So, and uh, Narcan is also available over the counter at pharmacies now as mm -hmm. well. And you do not need a prescription for it. And we actually talked about that in one of the prior episodes of this series. We actually talked to a paramedic who talked about how your brain, the receptors in your brain actually change mm -hmm. and, and how Narcan works. So, so that's, it's quite interesting to learn the process of how that works. And, and I think it's also important to note that when we talk about the addiction, that your brain actually does change. Correct. So a lot of people may not look at it like a medical issue, but it is. Can I add Absolutely. something to her too? Yes. Anybody who's been using or getting Suboxone off the street mm -hmm. or dabbling in it, getting some from here or there or buying it, trying to quit, mm -hmm. and then they go back, to, they have a their relapse right. and they go back to using, they that blocks those receptor mm -hmm. sites. So they're not going to feel this much mm -hmm. drug. They may start to get this much, and then that leads to right, an overdose right. too because they're trying to override the Suboxone mm -hmm. that's in their system. Mm -hmm. So that can help them too with, for an overdose. Right. That's, that's just so scary. So, Andrea, how can someone access the substance use services at CIBH? Um, so somebody can access uh, any of our substance use services mm -hmm. by coming in. They're going to start with my same-day access program. Um, so you can walk in anytime, Monday through Friday, from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, you're going to complete what's called the registration process and the intake process. Um, you can do those separately if you want to. All together, it takes about three hours. If you do just the registration, it takes about an hour. Intake takes about two hours. After that time, we're going to collect a whole bunch of information so that we can refer somebody to the appropriate uh, services there. And then, like Kim said earlier, for like the OBOT program, for example, we would then go ahead and schedule those first appointments for you. So it's that easy. And again, you can go to the CIBH website to get more information. Yep, absolutely. So I, I know in the in the a couple of episodes we've already done on this, how important breaking the stigma is. And so, Cottrell, can you give us a little bit more detail about why it's important to break the stigma? Definitely. Um, you know, stigma is one of the um, is one of the most uh, addiction is one of the most stigmatized health conditions mm -hmm. out there. Um, people who are struggling 
you know, it keeps them from getting services, you know, it isolates them, you know, it drives wedges between families, um, and it is, overall it just keeps people from getting the help that they need, you know, because of the stereotypes and the prejudice that they have. They feel they're going to be judged, and um, so it's really crippling, and it comes, you know, there's different types of stigma, and, you know, with people who are struggling with addiction, they are already beating themselves up as it is. And then we're, <clears throat> then they're trying to uh, understand or trying to, um, they're trying to not be what other people think right, they are, right. you know, because they feel they're being judged about what being an addict, you know. And I just want to speak mm -hmm. on the stigma too. Sure. That can go hand in hand with the harm reduction stuff. So mm -hmm. because of the stigma, people might not use these services that are out there to prevent that harm and again can increase the chance of somebody's life being taken mm -hmm. um, when it shouldn't be because of that stigma. Exactly. And I think it's important to note that the demographics have changed drastically over mm -hmm. the years. You know, this the stigma or the thought that that people may think, well, somebody who has this, this disorder is someone who I may not associate with or may be of a certain income or, or demographic, and that's absolutely not true, as we know. Mm -hmm. um, it, overdoses, having, having talked to both the police and the fire chief, the demographics and you know the first responders who were responding to these, these calls are seeing everything. Mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't matter what your income is, what your social status, n you know, no one is immune. Exactly. You know, and it's not just people who are uh, just out seeking medication, mm -hmm. I mean, seeking drugs. Sometimes you may have had a surgery. Mm -hmm. You know, you had back Definitely. surgery, and your doctor gives you a uh, Percocet or, or a dentist procedure, and you get, uh, you know, you get oxycodone mm -hmm. or vice versa, and you take those, and then you're, you, know, you run out, and you still feel like you have mm -hmm. that level of pain, and you can't get any more, right. so then you end up turning to the street and getting something that's not the same thing. Because uh, pills and, you know, oxys are not really right. the oxys they used to be. They can be pill pressed and mixed with fentanyl. Mm -hmm. So now you're taking something that you believe is the same thing you were prescribed, but it's not. It's actually right. more dead. It's deadly. And just to piggyback off of that, um, substance use happens on a spectrum. So you can have people that might not even be prescribed something, but they're using a substance recreationally. Maybe they use it as a party drug, like mm -hmm. once a year or something like that. With how potent and addictive fentanyl is, and it is in every substance that's out there, pretty much I think other than maybe alcohol is the only substance they haven't found in right. yet. Right. Um, so you could just be using something once, but because of the, its addictive properties. And your genetics you, plays a part in that really? too. Yeah. So not only just you know, occasionally, because that occasionally starts off with once every two weeks, and then you're like, oh, I remember mm -hmm. when I took that, I felt better. Well, then you take it once a week. Well, I'm not going to take it more right. than once a week. Well, then we go down to every three days and two days, and then we're twice a day, three times a day, four mm -hmm. times a day. But genetics plays a big part in this, too, about 50%. Really? So it's not only, oh, I like it and I'm not, but mental health plays a portion in this. Sure. Uh, genetics plays a huge oh. portion in this, up to 50%. Yes. Really? So someone who may have like addictive... So say What's your that? mom mm -hmm. or your dad has addiction issues, your sister has addiction mm -hmm. issues, your grandma had addiction right. issues, you increase your risk 50% by having it in the family. Mm -hmm. And I was just going to say, and avoiding the withdrawal too. I mean, that's oh, a yeah. big one that you hear all the time. So people might not want to keep using it just because it makes them feel good. They're going to keep using it because if they're not using it, they become so unbelievably sick. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I was an outpatient, I heard people tell me that they would experience suicidal ideations for the first time in their entire life really? just because of how sick they would feel yep. from it. Um, so it was either I want to kill myself right now or I'm going to use again just to avoid feeling like this. Mm -hmm. exactly. That's and we have a lot of clients who come in who only use so they don't get drug sick. Yep. Mm -hmm. They don't get. Do they call it dope sick. Right. But so right. they don't get I've dope sick. Expression. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they use enough to keep them from experiencing, experiencing all of those withdrawals. Yes. Yes. But the problem is, is then they're still using, and that addiction is still it there. It just keeps going. And it takes a little, maybe a little bit more, mm -hmm. or a little bit more. Mm -hmm. The time between times has shortened, right. and so they're just kind of in a vicious cycle. And that's what we're here to help with. Right. Absolutely. So, Cottrell, tell us about um, peer services and what is unique about it. Okay, so um, with peer services, is is conducted by peers, and a peer is someone with lived experience, um, either with substance use disorder or mental health um, disorder. So, with a peer, they're um, 
they have lived experience. Mm -hmm. So we're able to to come alongside someone who's struggling and kind of support them with where they are um, on their own mm -hmm. self-directed path to recovery because there are many different ways to recover. Mm -hmm. So when we are matched with people, we have lived experience and it's that mutuality right. that helps us. You know, I've been where you are, mm -hmm. so I know your pain and your suffering. When you tell me you're dope sick, oh, I know, I have a picture. I've been there, I've done that, so I can connect and uh, we can make a wellness connection. And that opens the door, and it, sometimes it helps to bridge the gap between the right. clinical and the real life. It helps uh, the peers to open up, mm -hmm. and we're able to get to the exact nature of how to best serve them, you know. And then we're able to make plans of recovery once they're stable, mm -hmm. um, you know, for their life. Get your life back on track. We make a wellness recovery action plan, you know, and uh, different groups that we have. Mm -hmm. You know, so we, we help facilitate in that way. And we're non-clinical, so it's not like you're coming in to see a clinician. Right. It's like coming in, sitting down, talking to a, a pal or somebody mm -hmm. that can relate to where you are and um, some of the struggles that you're experiencing. Because, you know, when, you, um, when you're struggling with addiction, it's not just one thing. It's not just the drugs. Your life has been affected in so mm -hmm. many different ways. Um, and it affects your family. It's not just uh, you, you're, you're taking a substance. You're disconnected from your family, your children, mm -hmm. cousins. You're not present in uh, holidays and family events. It's felt all throughout the family. So uh, we're, help, we're able to help get that connection back. And I also want to mention that, that Cottrell, you were one of the hosts on one of our Chesapeake Television's programs, Recovery Life. Yes. So I think that that's an awesome show that talks about the different stages and, and elements of recovery. Yes. And that can be found on our YouTube page. Awesome. So definitely thank you for that. And so Jennifer, what are the signs and symptoms that indicate a substance use disorder? Whew, okay. Yeah. That's a wide, <laughs> a wide range. Well, I would tell you, you know, there are things like a drop in attendance, maybe in functions or work or gatherings, um, maybe doing things that is really out of their norm, really isolating ourselves. A lot of times my people will tell me, oh, my parents, nobody knew, you know, I just go to the bathroom and use it. Well, when you go to the bathroom 14 times in right. an hour, they either think you got a UTI or they think right. you have a substance use. Um, you might have things like decrease in appetite or not eating, staying up for days because right. you're using, depending on what substance mm -hmm. you use, you might find nodding off. You might find dilated pupils. You could find starting of even the teenagers starting into the doing stuff illegally mm. um, or finding things in their rooms that are not theirs where burglary right. and things like that could start happening. They remove themselves from like sports activities or they remove themselves from their children. They may withdraw and go into things like video games mm. because mm. the movement and um, the graphics right. enhances some of their, their highs. Okay. Um, you could have things like a sudden change in anger, irritability, agitation, even aggression. Um, you can have things like unusual smells on them, their breath, their clothing, which can also indicate some, uh, smoking of something or inhalation of mm -hmm. something. Um, you could have these unusual moods, hallucinations, paranoia, things that are, they may be talking to somebody mm -hmm. who's not there or shaking their head and shifting around looking mm -hmm. because they see things moving around those things. I don't want it, people to get the idea that everything like that is all substance use right. because this could be mental health. Right. But a lot of people start to use because of trauma and because of mental health. You know, if you have, uh, if you have hallucinations and paranoia, a lot of times people use to drugs to kind of calm those symptoms mm -hmm. down. Well, now they've had that kind of mental health along with substance use together, which is not a really good cocktail. So we, we like to put things out there so people can be on alert. And I don't mean high alert, no, but, just but if they see aware, those simple changes, right. know that there's something going on, whether it's mental health, whether it's substance use or a combination mm -hmm. of both. Um, you may even find things in your teens or your husband, wife, kids, right. whatever, rooms 
Uh, you know, you may lift, put some clothes away and find it tucked in a drawer right. somewhere. And, and the other thing is, is that we are, we are about harm reduction. Right. We are also about safety. Um, when you enter our program, we also give you a lockbox to put your medicines mm -hmm. in there. Um, the youngest, and I will say for me, the youngest I've seen positive for opioids is five. And that's because they got into something that was their families. And then they have this in their system. Now they also have some addiction problems at five because they've been getting in and out of things and, that have been touched and, and, and everything. And I was going to say, and mm -hmm. I know um, we talked a little bit about like the kit, mm -hmm. but also how important is it for, say, you have a surgery and then you're prescribed some, you know, medication that's mm -hmm. going to help with that and you don't finish the whole bottle, how important is it to make sure that you dispose of that medication? Ooh, number one, importance. Um, <laughs> because one, you don't know who comes in and out of your home, who comes in and out mm -hmm. of your bathroom, where usually a lot of our stuff is right. stored. We don't know if our... our uh, our spouse or our children are sneaking in and getting Correct. it or even selling it. Right. You right. know, they don't necessarily have to use it, but they can sell it. And, and pills go for quite a bit per tablet um, or if kids can get into it. Um, they are a little bit better about putting safety right, locks right. on things. But right. if, you don't, if you don't have children in your home and your grandchildren come over, sometimes the locks are off right. and upside down because they have problems with their hands or arthritis, things right. like that, opening them, and then they can get into it, you yeah. know. And sometimes these little pills look like little candies well, to kids. And, and I will say, how, when we talk about the importance of that, I know that um, CIBH has has the bags we do. that you can put those in. But this is actually something that um, you, the pharmacy will give you if you have a prescription. So if you do not finish your, you know, the pills mm -hmm. you can put these in and it gives you instruction. Mm -hmm. And they also have a little pamphlet that tells you about, um, let's talk about, you know, opioids, things like that, just sort of to educate you. And I know our police department has a take back box mm -hmm. as well. Yes. So there are a lot of opportunities and, and it's so important, I think, to, to get rid of that, those pills, because like you say, I know a lot of people, you wouldn't even know if they were missing, I would think. Mm -hmm. So... So that's horrible. Yes, when you and talk at about CIBH, five years we have old. them right by the front door. Right. Okay. You don't have to be a member, or a, I say a member, <laughs> a, a client uh, yeah, at correct. CIBH. Gotcha. Um, they're at, by our front door. You put all the pills in there. You put water in there. Shake it up. It dissolves it all. Neutralizes everything, and you can throw it in the trash can. Right. That's so, easy. yeah. So we encourage people to do that. Also, uh, we're right down the corner. Right. You know? Right. And and that's one thing that people think. Well, how, what can I do to help this this crisis? Well, that's one mm -hmm. thing you can do. For sure. So what are the benefits of MAT? And first, can you tell us what that is? So that's medication assisted treatment. Okay. Um, and what you do is that's our OBAT program. Okay. Okay. And that includes two things. For us, we only do Suboxone. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then there's also methadone. There's, they have methadone mm -hmm. clinics out there that can, can help people with that also. We choose to do Suboxone only. Um, it is films or, or pills. Uh, either one. We do our, we are writing up now a full um, protocol to do sublocade, uh, which is an injectable okay. uh, for once a month. So you don't have to keep taking in case you go off on trips or mm -hmm. business meetings and things like that. You don't have to worry about bringing them, taking them, putting them in your mouth, all of that things. Um, and so what that helps is some people say, well, you're just, you're just moving one drug to another. Mm -hmm. Well, that is true. But we're moving it to a safe environment where people are monitoring you, that we're helping you get the wraparound treatments mm -hmm. and assistance that you need for success. We're meeting you where you are at that point in life, and we're walking side by side with you mm -hmm. to get where you need to be or where you want right. to be. And that is our goal. The good news is, is that we're able to decrease the Suboxone in small amounts over a period of time so that you don't have that sudden drop, the right. withdrawal symptoms, the cravings, because it does help with the cravings. Um, and it also, we get it. Some people stumble and trip and go mm -hmm. over little speed bumps, but we're there to dust to help dust you off, pick yourself back up and move on and meet you right there to help mm -hmm. you move on. So with that, we're able to move you off of your drug of choice, get you onto a safe amount in a consistent amount and be able to wean off safely and slowly so you don't have the right, side effects. Right. Okay. So I think I, ha I have one last question is, sure. is substance use a choice? 
Or okay, more to so, it. Okay, so, you know, <laughs> it's funny because it, you can ask 100 people right. and get 100 different answers. Absolutely. Okay? So, is it a choice? The first time that you use sometimes is a choice. Right. And I say sometimes because those, those people who are trafficked often get drugged early on and stay That's drugged. True. Um, a lot of times if you're in a household where there's always around, your parents are giving it to you. Mm -hmm. Here, take this. Here, take that. Here, oh, you hurt? Take that. Oh, you got to sleep? Take that. Those kind of things. So in that case, it's a little different. But the first time using is sometimes a choice, you know, with, whether it's peer pressure or friends or I have a mm -hmm. headache or I have a bone pain, a right. back pain. The rest, though like I said, is about 50% genetics. And when those genetics kick in and you have a history of it, you lose control. Right. And you lose control pretty quickly. The rest of the time, you start and sometimes you just can't stop. Right. Despite genetics. Because one, it's covering up a symptom. You like the way it feels. You lose everything that's going on around you. I have a bad day. Well, not no more. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm breaking up with my husband. I don't care. You know, those right. kind of things because lifestyle, life choices, life around you, the, the depressions, the anxieties, the overwhelming of being a single mm -hmm. parent with four children and up, down, feed them good, uh, right. all of these things can all play a part into that. So I don't think it's all choice. Right. I don't think it's all genetics. I think it's a combination of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Way more complex, I think. Mm -hmm. than way like more complex. Absolutely. It changes the chemistry in your brain. Correct. Um, so I remember one time somebody explained it this way to me, and it was probably the best way I've heard it explained. If you imagine having like a bar in your brain, right, we have certain chemicals in our brain that make us happy. And so let's say that before you ever use a substance in your entire life, this is where that bar sits. And when we do normal life activities, for, for some maybe it's skiing, for some maybe it's just watching TV, reading a book, whatever, that makes you happy. It's going to release a certain amount of those chemicals, and it's going to hit that bar. When it hits that bar, you feel good. You feel happy, right? When you start using substances, this bar goes up because it's flooding your brain with more and more and more of those chemicals that make you happy, right? So all of a sudden, this bar is up here, and when you engage in those normal activities, it's not releasing enough to hit that bar. Mm. So you're not feeling happy anymore. That's that high. People yep. like that high. They want to feel good. They want to feel happy. Right. Literally alters your brain. That is no, no one's choosing for that to happen. Most people are uneducated on it. They have no idea that that's going to happen. And, and then, then you're constantly chasing that. You're chasing that, that happiness, high. that high. Or conversely, yep. you're trying to escape some suffering. Yep. I think right. that's mm -hmm. the other yep. part. You know, mm -hmm. the genetics or an attempt to really escape some traumas that have yes been in a person's life too. Absolutely. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. For me, it started as recreational, you know, just to be a part of the scene, mm -hmm. the party scene, and um, just being exposed to it then. And then when I wasn't at the party, then, yeah, I want to have that same level, of, you mm -hmm. know, where I was because it was a coping mechanism for me for trauma and things I was, I was going through at that time. I didn't want to face the reality mm -hmm. of that. And I remember, oh, yeah, when I was doing this, I, that went away. So I started to want to have that feeling all the mm -hmm. time. And I found that my tolerance increased. I used to be able to control it. I could do it on the weekend at the party. Well, as I kept doing it, that got out of control. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the weekend at the party. It was, I was looking for it all during the week. Um, and it just continued to, to build and build and build until it just took over my life. It wasn't that I had any control over it because I had to do it or be sick. Mm -hmm. You know, and that wasn't going to happen. So, um, you know, it goes from there. But for me, it, like you said, the first time was a choice. But after that, and the drugs that are out today are way more addicting. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. you don't have that, that time period in between doing it, um, you know, sometimes or just on the weekend. You're almost instantly addicted because it takes right. you so high so fast, um, you know, to you. You're like, oh, I got to get some more of that. And then your brain is like, get me some more of that, or you know, you really gonna be bad. So. And yeah. you mentioned as well. I think we earlier we talked about the the dangers of fentanyl being in almost everything. So your first time could be your last time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Correct. So because this much is good and this much is deadly. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. The yeah. other thing I wanted just to touch on too is there's something out there called xylazine now. Okay, it is a tranquilizer. Mm -hmm. They call it Trank. Okay. Yes. I've heard um, of it. So it is immune to Narcan. 
So if you're mm. not in a really close vicinity of a paramedic or you're not close vicinity of an mm -hmm. ER, um, your life will probably be lost. Mm. Um, they shoot it also, and you'll see a lot with necrotic legs and uh, veins and open sores that will go all the way up because it really erodes right. and makes, your, makes tissue and veins mm. necrotic. Mm. So this is the new things that are coming out that are, are deadly that we cannot control as well as we have in the past with people who have overdosed that we could get to. Right. So, and that's why I think it's so important to have this conversation because, you know, we're living in different times, as they mm -hmm. say, mm -hmm. and having that conversation with your children, mm -hmm. your loved ones, your family members, just education is such a big part. Like I've learned a lot just sitting here today. And I, I want to thank each and every one of you because this is so important. And um, just go to CIBH, the website, yes. and we'll put all of that up there along with phone numbers and awesome. more information. And um, thank you again. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Thanks for having us. You're Good. welcome. Yeah. I would like to mention a couple other programs that are also helping to combat the opioid crisis here in our city. Chesapeake Regional Healthcare's PROUD program, which is Prevention and Recovery from Opioid Use Disorder. The hospital is the first in the Hampton Roads region to manage patients with OUD using medication-assisted treatment. And to learn more about the PROUD program, please watch our interview with Dr. Ben Fickenshire on youtube.com slash City of Chesapeake. Also, Operation Bold Blue Line, Chesapeake police officers are working diligently with state troopers to help reduce violent crime by getting illegal drugs and weapons off the street. And to learn more about this program, go to thecityofchesapeake.net police. Thank you all for joining me on this special edition of A Closer Look. I hope we were able to shed light on the opioid crisis and the ways we can make a difference in our city. As a society, we have the power to address this issue with compassion and resilience. Let's work together to provide support, reduce stigma, and save lives. Remember, if you or someone you know is struggling to reach out for help, there is always hope and recovery is possible.